So uh, welcome to the Solar for Small Business Installation Options and Funding for SMEs, Small Medium Enterprises and Farms. I'm Jackie Donaldson and I'm the Hub Coordinator for Green Economy Peterborough. Joining me is Natasha Schuert, who's the Program Coordinator for Net Zero Farms and Emma McDonald, Manager of, uh, of Agricultural Innovation and Stewardship at Farms at Work. Today's speakers, we're very lucky to have joining us um, uh, a uh, JP uh, Palu, who is the uh, co-owner of uh, Generation Solar. We have with us Steve Waldfong from uh, Lake Edge Cottages and who have installed a solar installation on the resort property. And then finally, we have uh, Norm uh, Norm Lamoth with uh, Wood Woodley Farms, and they have uh, installed a passive solar greenhouse. So we're talking big installations, but at the end, uh, we also have uh, Emma uh, uh, McDonald, uh, who will be talking to us uh, both a little about um, smaller uh, farm-based solar, um, just briefly farm-based solar uh, things that you can apply uh, at your if you own a farm, and also she'll be sharing us uh, with us some funding opportunities for everybody. And I know that that's a really big one for folks. So um, I am gonna let you know a little bit about Green Economy Peterborough. So um, for those who haven't attended one of our events before, uh, Green Economy Peterborough or GEP as we call ourselves is a local program and network uh, of Peterborough Green Up, uh, we support local business leaders to reduce their environmental impact. Uh, Green Economy Peter Bem Peterborough members work through a process to understand and then and scope and reduce the greenhouse gas emissions while learning and celebrating their successes with each other and together and benefiting from the reduced costs, the improved brand, Im brand image and becoming more resilient. So. Uh, currently, uh, we're delivering a pilot project called Net Zero Farms, and I'm just going to pass it over to Natasha to tell us a little bit about that. Thanks, Jackie. Uh, so hi again, everybody. Like I mentioned previously, my name is Natasha. I am the program coordinator of Green Economy Peterborough's six month long pilot project, Net Zero Farms. Net Zero Farms is a branch of Green Economy Peterborough offering an adapted version of the program specific to the agricultural sector. So we are capturing emission sources that are unique to the farmscape, while also very importantly, looking at carbon sequestration. We are set to wrap up the pilot in March. It's been so much fun. It has flown by, uh, but we hope to see it in some shape or form in the future. Thank you, Natasha. So you can see some of our members there. Um, they're a real fun bunch. It is a joy to work with them. Uh, and uh, so I'll just tell you, but it's not just us. We are actually a part of, uh, it's, it's uh, Green Economy Canada, and it's a network of hubs across the country. And uh, together we share uh, experience and uh, learnings and um, it just a, different initiatives. So we're, we're not solely uh, in this region, we can tap into the whole country. So you can see some, you can see where the uh, other hubs are located on that slide. So that's 250 green economy leaders. I think it's much higher than that now, um, but it's a, a great group and we learn a lot from them. So that is uh, who we're tapped into. And then finally, this is our membership. These are, uh, there's 29 right now, uh, green economy uh, leaders uh, in this region. And uh, they're again, a super bunch. So um, I just wanted to, while I'm talking about how great they are, I, 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 that local piece is very important. And uh, so, you know, together, you know, we buy each other's products or services, we're business peers, we're neighbors, we're friends, we see each other around town and at events and in our parks and on, and on our bikes. And uh, sometimes we work, work on projects together. So um, that, that membership group is, is really uh, meaningful for us. And I think it's our superpower, honestly. Um, so uh, we call them green economy leaders and, uh, and they all have interesting stories to tell. So including some of the experiences you'll hear today. So before we move on, I just wanna let you know about our advisory committee. Um, this is, these are the folks who sort of provide us support locally 
um, Peterborough Chamber, Peterborough Economic Development, uh, Selwyn uh, Township, uh, Trent, uh, two uh, businesses, which is great, the City of Peterborough uh, and the County of Peterborough, all very important. And together we are working towards uh, Peterborough uh, Kawartha Economic Development's Future Ready Strategic Vision, which is to be the most innovative and uh, sustainable community and economy in Ontario. It's a great goal. So with that, uh, so I will introduce you to our first guest. That guest. So JP Polly is uh, the co-owner of Generation Solar. For 25 years, JP and his team have been the go-to experts on solar and installation in our region. You may see their trucks. If you're from the area, you will see their trucks uh, driving back and forth with their, with their beautiful logo uh, on, on it and uh, working towards making our community greener. So there's nothing JP doesn't know. And uh, so we are very lucky to have JP uh, joining us today and lucky to have Generation Solar as a green economy uh, member. So over to you, JP. Uh, I am a co-owner in Generation Solar, and uh, and as I mentioned, we've been doing this for 25 years um, in Peterborough. Uh, our reach goes beyond Peterborough, typically within about a 90-minute radius of Peterborough, but we have clients from Lake Ontario to Ottawa to Algonquin Park, uh, Huntsville, almost to Georgian Bay, and a little bit in the city of Toronto as well. We are what we call EPC, East that stands for engineer, procure, construct. That means we do the design, we get the stuff and we build it. And then we also do all the service and commissioning after the fact for now, principally solar electric projects, meaning the conversion of solar energy into electricity. Historically, we've done wind energy, we've done solar water heating, solar air heating, a whole bunch of renewable technologies. Uh, but for a bunch of reasons, we've really focused on uh, photovoltaic or solar electric technology. I have a very brief presentation today. Uh, it's, it's quite short and it's quite general. Uh, I think that if this tweaks your interest, then I'd be happy to have conversations offline or have questions afterward. And it sounds like uh, a presenter later on might have some specifics on funding opportunities, which is really exciting. So I look forward to hearing about that uh, as well. So this is just a handful of slides about clean energy for farm and for business. Just a bit of a recap. I think this is kind of why we're all here, isn't it? I mean, we've got a greenhouse gas emission problem. Um, and if you look at the parts that I have highlighted, these are the sections that we as individuals and business owners have the opportunity to influence um, transportation, buildings, electricity consumption, and agriculture, which is a portion of our total national greenhouse gas uh, emissions. Um, we're here to talk about solar, clean energy, renewable technology covers a whole bunch of technologies, but, but I'm just here to talk about solar. We do work in battery technology and energy storage. I'm not talking about that today. If it's something that interests you, reach out and we can, we can have a conversation offline. So um, why? Like, what are the benefits of solar? And I think these images capture the benefits of solar for me. So on the upper left hand, it, it, talking about greenhouse gas emissions, talking about climate action, um, clean energy does not burn fossil fuels. It does not create climate gases. It, it's low pollution. And so there's a big win for the climate with clean energy. Other things that people are interested in on the bottom left-hand corner of the screen, you can reduce your costs or like your energy costs with clean energy. Um, a quick question. There's noise going on in the background. Can you hear that or is it acceptable? Acceptable. It's acceptable? Okay, thanks. Um, Budgeting, so not only can you reduce your energy costs with clean energy, but you can stabilize them. And I've got a slide later on about that. It might be quite interesting, but from a business perspective, stabilizing your input costs is very valuable for planning. If you know that you're de-risking one of your major inputs, um, that's very valuable. And then in the bottom right-hand corner, the idea is that people like clean energy. And from a business perspective, it have, offers marketing benefits, uh, it offers uh, uh, cultural benefits. It's, it, it's things that people get excited about. And if you're in business, it's nice to have people getting excited about your business. Okay, so stepping back though, why, why do we, would we choose solar over other things that we can do? And I just wanna take a really broad perspective here on why we spend money on anything. 
you know, and <clears throat> the reality is we spend the money, we choose to spend our money on the things that fall in the middle of that Venn diagram. The, there's things that interest us and there's things that are accessible to us. The things that interest us and are accessible to us are the things that we go ahead and do. It's, to me, it's a very simple context or a very simple concept, but it gets lost in, in a lot of the, the chatter around the complexities of climate change and clean energy. And so just to give you a, a quick little example, you know, if you're thirsty and if you like being with your friends and you like beer, these are the things that interest you on the one hand. And on the other hand, you've got some money in your jeans, you've got some time to spare in your downtown where the bars are, well, I, I'm going to stop and have a beer, right? So that's the intersection of things that interest me and, and things that are accessible to me. If some of those things are missing, it doesn't work. If you don't have the time, if you don't have the money, then you can't stop for a beer. It doesn't work. This is where we started. This is why we're here. This is what interests us, is addressing this, this challenge with climate change. And so if that's what interests us, is it dealing with this, what's accessible to us? And depending on who we are, there are lots of things that we could do. You know, we could walk or cycle to work, we could hang our clothes on a laundry line. We could install a heat pump. We could add insulation to our home. We could take public transit or avoid transit altogether and work from home. I think there are lots of you that are, that are sitting at home right now. Uh, you could buy an EV. You can shop at the farmer's market. That's a great way to reduce uh, greenhouse gases of transportation and materials. There are lots of things that we as individuals can do to address our concerns about, about climate change. So when it comes to solar, so so there are those things that we talked about earlier. We talked about uh, sustainability, environmental benefits, reducing costs. And these are the things that we want or that interest us. On the right-hand side, there are things about accessibility of solar. Well, you need a building. We'll talk about these things later on. But you need some kind of building or facility. You need a utility account. I'm not addressing off-grid at this point. Uh, that's a totally separate conversation. Uh, and you need funds or access to funds. And You'll notice the solar in the middle there is in both of the circles. So if you're interested in solar, and it, if you have access to solar, then it makes sense that you might spend money on solar. If you're not interested in it, go do something else. Look at other ways to address the climate crisis. Um, I'm not here to tell you it's a silver bullet, because it's not. But if it interests you, and it's accessible to you, then it's a reasonable thing to do. I think that farmers and clean energy are a great pair in particular for a few reasons. Number one is when it comes to climate change, farmers have a lot of skin in the game. Their livelihoods depend on the climate. They understand this very, very deeply. And so they are stakeholders and they understand that. Another reason is uh, farmers understand capital investment. They understand buying a piece of equipment or a piece of property um, and the, the, the economics around investing in that for a long-term long gain. And then the last reason is farmers have a very long time horizon. They are, they are accustomed to uh, thinking with a long time horizon. Uh, some of them are doing legacy planning for family to come up behind them and take over the farm. Uh, they understand the long view. And so for those reasons, I think farming and clean energy are uh, a great pair. Now, getting down to some of the, the more brass tacks of it. So when you, when you look at a solar energy system today, how do, we, how do we connect it and what does it do for us? Well, the way that we connect it to our homes, to our businesses is called net metering. And what that means is energy from the solar energy system is pushed into your home or your office, or your building. It's used by your appliances in parallel with the grid. So if you look at the slide, you'll see um, the grid on the far left, uh, a meter, an electrical panel, an appliance across the top, and then the solar array down at the bottom. And the color of the arrows indicates energy flow. Blue arrows is energy from the grid. And you'll recognize this, energy comes from the grid through your meter, to your panel, to your appliances. That's very typical. When we're doing net metering, we add this additional component of the solar array, which is pushing energy into your electrical panel. In the orange arrows, you can see 
orange arrow is going backwards through your meter to the grid. So that's energy you don't need at the moment. And then between the panel and the appliance, it's a mix of blue and orange. You don't know necessarily where it comes from. The appliance doesn't care, the panel doesn't care, the solar doesn't care, but that's how the electrons flow in a system that's, that's net metering. The point here is that the energy can flow bi-directionally back and forth to the grid. And the meter, which the utility monitors, is tracking all the energy that's coming and going in both directions. And so your bill will have a section that says, this is all the energy that you took from the grid, that's the blue stuff. This is all the energy you put back to the grid, that's the orange stuff. It calculates the difference between the two, and that's what you pay. So if I just give you a quick example, here in the office that I'm sitting in right now, we have a solar array on our roof. Because we're solar guys, it's a really big array, it's generating way more energy than we need. We're chronically feeding extra clean energy into the grid. But what that impact is on our bill is our bill has been about $40 a month ever since we put the system in because we have a chronic surplus of, of energy. Um, okay, so who can, who can do this? So this gets back to the accessible part of my earlier slide. In order to do a net metering, you pretty much need to own a facility of some sort, own a home, own a business, own a farm, and you have to own the utility account. So if you're a tenant, uh, it becomes more difficult. If you uh, have utilities included in rent or something, that, that becomes more difficult. So really, we're, it's not impossible, but it becomes a lot more difficult. So really, we're targeting homeowners, business owners, uh, a condo board. You know, They own the building, and there are common areas. So they have a utility account, that are a common account. That would be a, a candidate. Uh, if you're a landlord, and if you include utilities in your rent, then there's a great opportunity to look at a net metering solar energy system. That last line there refers to third party ownership, which is um, not gonna be relevant for projects of the scale we're talking about here, but there are ways for other people to own the system, other people to own the building and that sort of thing. Um, much more common in the States, becoming common in, in Canada, but not, not really at this point. Speaking very broadly about how much does this technology cost, um, rooftop solar at the small scale, this would be like a residential scale or, or even a small business. You're probably looking at 20 to $40,000. All kinds of variables here. I, I, I'm not intending to be comprehensive, just to give you a really broad brush approach or, or perspective on how much this stuff might cost. 20 to $40,000 at the smallest scale. When you bump up over a bit of a threshold, it becomes more of a commercial kind of, a, kind of thing. Uh, and we might be looking at a budget of 60 to 300 or more thousand dollars. Uh, these are all for roof mounted solar arrays. If you've got a farm and you want a ground mounted solar array, which is a great idea in my opinion, but there is an, an added cost because of the foundations and excavation. Um, sources of funding to, to offset those costs. I'm not a super expert on this stuff because a lot of the sources of funding are sector specific. So I think that um, Steve might tell you about some funding that he got from the tourism sector. We have a bunch of ag clients that are getting funding from uh, agricultural specific sources, and I can't stay on top of those things. Uh, but the business development um, uh, community futures is a great source for information about that. And I believe they have a relationship with Community Economy Peterborough as well. Banks are much more um, friendly to financing these kinds of things uh, now, although interest rates are kind of high, so that may or may not be a, a practical option. And then if you are here as part of a charity or not-for-profit, then you're in the business of collecting money from other people and doing fun stuff with it. If you can build a solar energy project using other people's money, well, that's the very best way to do it. And we do have some clients uh, that have taken advantage of that in the past. Levelized cost of energy is a way of tracking what the value of your electricity is. So there's a calculation there. But basically, if you look at all uh, the cost of putting in a clean energy project and divide it by all the energy it's going to generate over its lifetime, then you get a number in kilowatt hours. And that's the effective equivalent cost of electricity that you're paying or the energy you're getting from your system, right? So you spend X dollars on a system, it lasts Y years, 
um, you're getting benefit over those Y years. You can calculate the effective cost of that electricity and then compare it to other sources of electricity. This is a very useful way about looking at the value you're getting for a clean energy system. Uh, and you can think of it as um, when you're buying a system, you think of it as um, buying a contract to buy clean energy at a fixed price for the duration of, of the system. Um, like you're buying energy at whatever, 10 or 15 or 20 cents per kilowatt hour for 25 years, which is, let's say, the life of the system. The important thing here is levelized cost of energy is can be the same as or even lower than um, the cost to buy the electricity from the utility. And most importantly is it doesn't change. So this slide is the cost of electricity in Ontario over the last almost 20 years. The dotted lines are my own. So just to give you a bit of a, um, a bit of a tour here, um, this period from 2008 through 2014 was a very stable period. Then the politicians got involved and did some wonky stuff. Then uh, the, uh, the, the pandemic came and everything went to hell in a handbasket. I'm not gonna get into those details, but the point is I've chosen these dotted lines, trying to pick up on these trends from the past when electricity pricing was rising, but doing so in a stable, sedate fashion which is kind of what people want. No one likes this gymnastics over here. So uh, the, the red line is peak pricing for time of use. The green line is off peak pricing. So if we extend those trends out into time, you can see a projection of the bands within which electricity pricing will probably be changing in the future, notwithstanding all the wonkiness of the pandemic. And you can even see, if you're a fan of technical analysis, you can see that, uh, the price is trying to bump back onto these trends, uh, but for various pandemic reasons, gets getting knocked back down. And then over here on the right-hand side, this, this blue arrow, I did an analysis of one of my clients and their levelized cost of energy. And this is a farm project and it's before any incentives or rebates or any tax measures at all. Their levelized cost of energy was 15 cents. And it's a blue arrow that goes straight across, meaning for the next 20 years, they're effectively buying electricity at 15 cents per kilowatt hour. Meanwhile, the provincial price is potentially going up into these craziness, crazy zones up here. Obviously, it does not match the current pricing. Uh, I think that's unfair, an unfair assessment because of all this uh, pandemic craziness. There are some commercial specific incentives available. There is a 20% investment tax credit for any business, and that does not matter at scale. If you're a small business and you're putting up a small scale system, it's the same tax credit. Uh, and there are some favorable tax conditions with respect to how you write off this investment. Uh, there is an accelerated write down. And for the next uh, couple of years, it's 75% in year one, and then 55%, and then that ends in 2028. Meaning if you spend whatever, $100,000 in 2024 on a system, you can write down 75% of that in 2024, as opposed to having to depreciate it slowly over time. For some businesses, depending on their tax situation, that's a very attractive uh, opportunity. I'm not sure how I'm doing on time, but that's, that's it for me. Thank you, JP. Um, I will just... Uh, if you could, I'm going to share my screen now. Uh, we have uh, Steve Wildfarm from uh, Lake Edge Cottages. Uh, Steve and his family operate Lake Edge Cottages, which is a lovely resort just south of Young's Point. And I'm hearing somebody's mic. Um, maybe it's Steve's. Uh, uh, since joining Green Economy Peterborough, Steve has been very active at updating his property to become more sustain sustainable and efficient. In fact, we at Green Economy Peterborough can hardly keep up with him. Uh, he, uh, Steve actually in this past summer installed 110 solar panels on three of his resort buildings. And so he's here today to share with us uh, his motivations, experiences and tips. So over to you, Steve. Thank you, Jackie. 
Can you uh, see the screen okay? Yes, we can. All right, so uh, thanks for that introduction and thanks for having us here. Um, I'm gonna walk you through what, uh, what our project was about over the past year and why we went ahead with solar energy. Um, getting used to the screen here. So our family acquired Lake Edge Cottages up in Lakefield in, in 2018, we took over in 2019. So we've been here about five years. So we have a, um, a very popular existing business that uh, attracts about 250 clients a year, roughly 250 to 300, depending on whether it's, there's a pandemic or not. And uh, <clears throat> that's Ann and I in the, in the center. That's our son, Jacob, who lives on, on site with us. Uh, the three of us together maintain most of the work here on the property. And what we sell is fun and rest and relaxation. People come here uh, to have fun. They come here to relax. Um, oftentimes, they refer to it as their sanctuary. Uh, we have 12 and a half acres, 450 feet of shoreline. And uh, we have the occasional family event here as well. We've actually, our daughter actually got married here. And and the guests, they referred to, this is their magical place, many of them. Uh, we have photographers, we have artists that come. Um, we have people that just wanna come and sit on the dock and at night and watch the sun go down. Well, I do a sustainable project. So this, <clears throat> this is a, a deeper level to what JP was talking about for me. Um, for us, it, it's, it's really embedded in, in the fabric of our heritage. Um, when our family's been in Canada for, depending on which lineage, uh, anywhere from 250 to 500 years. Um, so we were some of the early pioneers and everything that uh, my grandparents went through, and some of you may relate to this, they talked about the Great Depression and they talked about saving. Nothing in our family ever was wasted. Uh, they saved jars made our own preserves, made our own jams and everything. So um, everything got saved. We had boxes of stuff. I used to wonder from my mother, where, where would you ever use this stuff? But she saved it and she gave it to charities or she used it herself. So what this slide really talks about is why did we do it? Well, first of all, um, uh, the benefits of going ahead with a sustainable project, <clears throat> given that background was it's good for the environment. It's good for our business, that's important. If you're a business owner, um, you have to know what's in it for you. And I'm gonna focus more on that part of it. Um, but the community is also tagged to that. Uh, what are you doing for the community? How does it affect uh, the place where you live? Um, and, and of course, the impact on future generations is another benefit. And <clears throat> it's not just us that see that, it's your, it's your customers that'll see that from a business perspective. Okay, so transition to solar energy. So we chose, we looked at it from different angles and uh, we thought we had the perfect location given our size, given the layout of our land where the green spaces were um, to capture a lot of the sun. So we wanted to start there and we wanted to go big. We wanted to do 100% off energy because once you get to that level, You've got economies where you can use that excess for other things to offset other areas like fossil fuels when you do heating in the, in the winter time. So I'll talk about that. Um, <clears throat> and the other thing we wanted to do, keeping the customers in mind, is give them something out of this. So we put in a, a, an EV charger into the same one of the buildings that has the solar panels so that they can feel good about bringing their EV cars up. Because it's not just that Lakefield, I think, has one or two. Um, but you don't want your customer going there or having to wait in line or having to wait a few hours to get their car filled up. You want them to sleep well overnight at your resort and know that their car is out there being charged. We get a little click that says someone wants to charge. I click my iPhone. Um, they get agreement. I get a summary of what they, what, how long they were hooked up. Uh, it's a great little system. And uh, so that's for them. And we don't charge for that. We could. And if it becomes contentious, we will. But for the next couple of years, we don't see doing that. 
So the project benefits, this is similar to what JP went through. Um, but, uh, but the one thing I can say about giving back to the environment, it's a good feeling, not just for you, but for your customers as well. Uh, the financials, um, kind of the questions I get asked a lot, what did it cost? What's the payback? All of those kinds of questions. Um, our payback uh, for our specific projects about seven to eight years in that time frame. Why? Because we got funding. So we had uh, government funding for tourism. It happened when COVID was, was uh, very hard on the tourism industry. We had to apply for that. Uh, we filled out applications and uh, uh, we were awarded uh, about half the project uh, for that. So that's why I have a term of about half uh, typically, I think for most, it's I've heard the range of about 14 or 15 years, which probably would be about what I would have done if we didn't get funding for for the for the payback. Um, and and so this year we bought electric heaters for our uh, little oil heaters that don't make any noise for our cottages, and that offsets the gas usage. And we have a tenant rent, renting year round. He's been here for three years. He says his propane fireplace has hardly come on. I've noticed my propane bill. Um, is down significantly. It's less than half what it was. Now, some of that would be because of the warmer weather. Some of it is because, because of the offset using the electricity. Hydro is next to nothing now. JP mentioned a cost of about $30, $40 a month. That's the bill I get, but but I get the HST back on that. So really, my, my net cost is about $8, $9 a month for the hydro part of it. Um, ongoing tax write-off. Um, uh, we do we do have a, a 30% in ours uh, depreciation per year, um, and, uh, and and the accountant applies that where he needs to. Um, so I think I'm not sure if we're using it this year or not, but I let uh, Grant Thornton worry about that. Um, and uh, it enhances customer loyalty. We have customers that come here a lot, and uh, we had a splash with uh, Jackie and Greenup, and we had the media here. And JP was out um, as because he is his company that did our project, and uh, we had the media out, and uh, we had ecstatic customers that saw that on TV. And uh, so um, this is a lady who said, "I'm not going to talk about uh, don't 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 misunderstand me, but I want people to know where I go in the summer. So that's why I never give you guys an online review or promote you." Well, she saw it. And uh, in green, she put this in uh, these comments in her social media on LinkedIn. <laughs> so she's she's uh, gone from not just being a loyal customer, but an advocate. And we had several customers um, do that. That's a great feeling, by the way, when you get customers that do that. Um, and it opens up the market for new opportunities like the environmentally conscious uh, tourists out there. Uh, we've had people come here and we can hear them whispering when they look at the solar panels and uh, it, it's, uh, it, it gives us a distinct and different brand, and I'll talk about that. The community part, uh, to, to JP's comment about the solar and how it's measured going in and out of the meter, um, the excess is used by the community on, on really hot days. That's when we're producing, when we're overproducing. We certainly don't overproduce in the winter. Um, but over the past year, for example, we went live on uh, around the 21st of January a year ago. Um, I've got a current credit still of $1,000 from last summer. So that's running it for a year. I've still got a credit of that amount. Um, and uh, it's a tax-free credit too. Um, whereas uh, if you get a check, I think, I don't know how that works, but you may have to pay tax on that. But the credit is, is, is for me, is a preferred way to go. Um, looking at the next slide. So I mentioned the brand and the media coverage we got. Um, on the left, we that's Jackie and, and our family here. We won a sustainability award with Green Up in May. And then the examiner came out for our ribbon cutting event. And then we were on Global TV and there were about six or seven different media um, people there. Um, but what that, what that does is if you're a small business and you're looking to build your brand, you wanna do stuff that makes people aware of what you're doing and keep them involved, especially your partners. Your partners are, are, are the reason to a large extent for, extent for your success. So, so in this business, we, we help each other out in that, in that sense. 
Um, so client satisfaction increased. They were part of that event too. We had long-term clients. One lady who's 60 years old, been coming here since she was three, was at that event. She was happy to see it. Um, and, uh, you know, they participated in, in the tour we did. Um, and, uh, and like I say, it differentiates you uh, in your business, especially for us in tourism. A lot of small businesses wouldn't do this. Some of the larger ones in Canada have, but not very, very many. Uh, I, I mean, to that extent, to, to taking to going fully off hydro. And then, you know, later in the year, we got involved in some of the promotional campaigns for Peterborough and Kawartha. So this is uh, PKED, uh, Peterborough Kawartha Economic Development, getting us involved in promoting the area. So this, this was an ad that ran for six weeks online uh, prior to Christmas to promote the Kawarthas uh, over the uh, winter time and the idea of pay it forward. So you, so, um, so that uh, people were more aware of, of the businesses. So we were one of four businesses selected for that campaign. And this was, this is, this is talking from my advice. My, just to give you an example, my background, before we took over that resort, um, I worked in corporate in Toronto. I was an account executive. I, I also managed large multi-million dollar bids, hundreds of millions of dollars and so on in size for banks and insurance companies and so on. And there was a lot of detailed thinking that went into how you're going to position yourself, how you're going to win driving cost out of the business for your customer and all of that kind of stuff. So when I went into this project, my immediate thought was um, we had two projects going on. I was building a building and I was hiring uh, JP to, to implement these solar panels and the two were interconnected because I needed that building built to finish my plan to get 100% off. So ideally I would have hired, you know, a construction company to do the building part and do the whole thing and just have one point of contact. Um, because of the time it was and because of the shortages of people and everything, I didn't get the people I wanted to do that. So I worked with JP directly and I managed the building part myself and JP managed the, uh, the solar panels. But give yourself lots of time because you're going to need uh, building permits to do this type of work. Choose an experienced supplier with a good track record. So I had gotten quotes from numerous companies, but some of them um, were young people, not nothing wrong with young people, but people that were on a call center that didn't have the experience of understanding um, beyond selling solar panels, what is involved in implementing a project like this. Uh, for example, when you trench, we had someone send us a copy of a, of a potential implementation with three or four solar panels on each cottage roof. Well, when you're trenching, that's, that's an impossible project. There's no way you would do a project in that fashion. So, you, you know, what I learned from, from JP was to concentrate uh, as much as you can in one area and to limit the amount of trenching and costs that you're going to incur because there's some complexities involved in it and avoid the winter as much as you can because that's going to limit the amount of time they can implement. Understand your risks and mitigation strategies with your supplier, whoever you choose. Um, so risks involving cost, budget increase, risks involving does the supplier have the supplies to meet the timelines you have. Um, you're going to be working with, uh, in our case, Hydro One. Um, Hydro One's different to work with. <laughs> they don't guarantee timelines. They, you fill out paperwork and you just hope they come back within the time frames that they suggest. Um, that worked extremely well for us, um, but sometimes they can take longer. Um, the oh, the um, other thing is make your make your supplier accountable for what they're doing for their piece of it, because because there's so much stuff that happens. When when I attended some of the meetings briefly just to come out and say good morning, um, there was a lot of uh, engineering terms and standards and triple E standards and so on. That's not my field. So leave it to the experts um, and, and make them accountable for it. Um, understand your overall budget and cost and then add 15%. And that's my background telling me to add 15%. And we use that 15% mainly because hydro is a little bit higher, not a lot, but they were a little bit higher than where they said they'd come in. Um, and uh, look for funding opportunities. Uh, that's been discussed and work with someone on the supplier side who, who, who you feel you can work and get along with. Uh, they're going to be your trusted advisor throughout this project. 
So they're the one, they're kind of the guide. They're the one in front with the machete cutting the weeds out of the forest as you're walking behind them. Um, so think about it that way. And in summary, um, don't think of sustainability as an event or as just a project that starts and stops. It's, it, it's, it's really, it's a lifetime journey. Um, we are going to, uh, this be, creates a foundation for us moving forward. Um, there's lots of exciting things we're going to do now that we have excess power going forward. Um, and uh, we can talk about that if anyone's interested afterwards. Um, but uh, it, it serves ourselves as, as a business community and a family and, uh, and of course, the environment. That's all I had, Jackie. <laughs> Thank you, Steve. <laughs> That was great. Uh, if anyone's looking for an adventure, <laughs> um, uh, please consider uh, visiting Steve and Anne and Jacob up at Lake Fields, our Lake Edge Cottages. And uh, I'm sure that they would uh, love to show you around. Um, so um, Steve, if you could stop, yep, yeah, stop share. Next we have uh, Norm Lamoth of uh, Woodley Farms. Uh, Norm is all about innovation and problem solving. He joined Green Economy Peterborough and Net Zero Farms Initiative to help fulfill his goal of becoming net zero, but really he's teaching us a lot <laughs> and teaching our community all the time. Norm is, a pro is prolific in his involvement uh, in moving sustainability forward in the agricultural sector. And in fact, was just facilitating an event Ontario soil and crop a mere 45 minutes ago. So he's in high demand. And um, so Norm owns an intergenerational crop, a uh, cash crop farm, maple syrup and market garden uh, in the beautiful hills of Cavan. And so I'm going to send that over to you now, Norm. Super. Thanks so much for having me, Jackie, Natasha, and Natalie, and the whole crew at, uh, at Green Up. It's always our pleasure uh, to share and to learn from others as well. Uh, this is a picture of our farm here. We're located in Cavan, Ontario. And as you can see here, I mean, photosynthesis has an amazing ability to uh, to be captured. We don't we don't see a lot of bare soil in this picture. Everything's covered. Uh, we have our market garden down there uh, past the cold frame greenhouse and our pond. And uh, in the background, you see uh, some fields that, that have some cover crops in them and, uh, and a beautiful fall setting. So we've been on this land since 1902, a sixth generation family farm. Up until about uh, the mid uh, 2000s, we were a 900 sow hog operation. And now we find ourselves sort of reverting back to a, a more traditional diverse operation. We have a three acre market garden and our primarily revenue comes from the cash cropping side of things. So we grow corn, soy, wheat and oats. And we also have a little barley project for a microbrewery in Toronto. We also have some additional um, crops that we grow, uh, so things like forages, we have hay, about 10 to 25 percent of all of our properties are in either woodlots or grassland areas and most recently we've uh, added a compost facility so about three years ago we uh, we approached the local municipality and uh, and the county and uh, discussed receiving the leaf and yard waste program here on our farm and so since then we've been processing that material into a compost that we use as an organic amendment on the farm and that's been uh, very beneficial to uh, to our land base um, Again, everything around sustainability for us is, is circular and figuring out how do we use waste products that are on site and converting those to usable materials for the farm. And, and in transitioning out of sort of a two crop rotation to a multi-crop rotation with cover crops, we found we were having uh, excessive crop residues that we had to deal with in the field. And so bringing animals back to the landscape has helped us mitigate some of those challenges. And uh, it, back in uh, 2022, we added a small flock of sheep, and that's up to about 100 breeding ewes now. And we'll continue to grow that uh, as our, our cropping cycle allows it. We also have a 1500 tap uh, maple syrup operation, and we certified that organic a couple of years ago. But today we'll talk a little bit about uh, solar and how we're using solar on the farm. We do have a couple solar installations. So we have a, a 10 kilowatt microfit system that was installed about 10 years ago on, uh, on one of our dormant uh, pig barns. Um, but most, uh, and most recently we've just installed another solar um, project here on the farm that will help us offset approximately 50% of our electricity use. 
but I'm here to talk to you a little bit today about a commercial pass commercial passive solar greenhouse that uh, that we installed and uh, this is a picture of it here and this came out of uh, a very unfortunate event here at the farm. We had a, a large fire back in 2018. And this is the original footprint of the bank barn that was situated on the property. And so after all the dust settled from the event, uh, we reconstructed a, a few buildings to replace some of the storage that uh, that we lost. And we had this large footprint from our um, bank barn that was located right up against the bank. Um, and we really didn't know what to do with the space. Uh, Mom and Dad always wanted a new syrup house. I always wanted a greenhouse that we could heat year round, and and we transformed the space into this new building. So on the far left there, you see the syrup house, um, and in between the syrup house and the greenhouse, we have a, a breezeway which is home to a cold storage area at the back of the uh, at the back of that space, and then we have an eighteen hundred square foot commercial greenhouse. And on the right hand side, we have an, an office space, which we use for uh, classroom, educational uh, lunchroom for staff in the summertime. And so the, the total footprint of the building is uh, is 130 feet long. And the peak of that greenhouse is 26 feet tall at the back and uh, and about 10 feet tall at the front. And so this is a picture of the construction of the greenhouse as we're going through. And as you can see, there's a fair bit of concrete that was built to, to retain that bank. And the, the whole building set right into that space, uh, right to the top of that concrete. So we've got about uh, 10 or 13 feet there of, of, of uh, material that's underground. And then we have another uh, 10 or 13 feet that are above the ground. Um, what we did with this system is we designed a passive solar forced air system. And the long big pipes that you see in the picture on the left and the right are what we call the header pipes. And uh, they're used to move air, essentially. So we have two inline 12-inch fans that pull the air from the peak of the greenhouse and push it underground. And at every foot uh, across the length of the greenhouse and at three different levels, we have a perforated pipe that goes between those two headers. And so the basic premise is we're capturing the warm air during the daytime and storing it underground. And at nighttime, when the temperature is cool, we're pulling that warm air back up out of ground. And all that's required to make this system work are these two 12 inch um, inline fans that we place on, on the main header. And I'll show you a picture of what that pipe looks like uh, in another picture. But overall on 1800 feet, there's about 1500 feet of, uh, of piping that runs underground at the six foot, seven foot and eight foot level. Um, and as you can see, the entire building's uh, insulated. And, and the concrete goes quite uh, quite deep into the ground as well. Here's a better picture of uh, of what the structure looks like. And so uh, my summer students here are, are punching holes into these twelve inch um, culverts essentially, and joining them with the uh, with the the perforated pipe. The columns that you see there are actually ground level in the greenhouse once this is all filled in, and they're the structural uh, they're the structural pillars that that hold up the roofing structure. And so these are the pillars as you see them on those on those blue columns, and you can see the uh, the entire structure here before it was was all finished. So the roof line itself is uh, is is on a single slope, and the idea there is that you're pulling the heat from the highest point of that roof line, so the peak of the roof where the the temperatures are the warmest, and and pulling them underground from there. The roof itself is a, a product called Solar Wrap. It's a German engineered product. It's a, it's essentially a large bubble wrap. And uh, I'll show you a picture here shortly of, of that installation as well. But here you can see the roof being installed. It's a, it's a very thin membrane. It might be a quarter inch thick. And uh, in this case here, the, the, the spans are two meters wide and they're pulled down through a rail system to, uh, to stretch out over the greenhouse and then wrapped in over the edges. But uh, they're, they're very good at diffusing the light. Uh, there's hardly any shadows in the greenhouse whatsoever. And uh, as soon as the sun comes up in the morning, the greenhouse immediately starts to heat. And as soon as the sun goes down at night, it starts to cool down because the R value of this structure is only about two and a half. And this is what the greenhouse looks like completely finished. Um, in this past year, I think we had 25,000 plants in here and uh, we supply these plants to the local market as farm gate sales. And we also supply a couple of uh, commercial wholesalers as well locally. 
So the farm for us really in, in the future and how we see using clean energy and, and solar is, is creating a, the circular economy. Anything we can do to convert waste to energy byproducts is certainly of interest to us. Um, this past January, we recently launched a, uh, a brand new forest biomass recovery program where we're going to continue to taste waste products being forest residues, um, things like plantation thinning, storm damage, um, any clearing that needs to happen for trail remediation, things of that sort, and bringing those material back to the farm here to, uh, to convert those initially to a compost product. But longer term, we're looking at the combined heat and power um, from those products as well. And fertilizer substitutes, we talked about agriculture and our role in emissions. About 10% of all the emissions in Canada come from agricultural practices. And uh, between 30 and 60% of the nitrous oxide emissions come from the agricultural sector. So we're always looking at ways to mitigate those and, uh, and, and decrease the, uh, the impact that we have. So there's my contact information if anyone wants to reach out or, or if anyone's interested and maybe Jackie, if, if there's enough interest, we could certainly organize a tour of the passive solar greenhouse at some point uh, in the future. Spring is always best when everything's in bloom, um, but I'd be more than happy to uh, to offer that to everyone. Thank you so much, Norm. I, I always get inspired when I listen to uh, you and the Net Zero crew and think I need to change my career. You know, let's get into farming because... Uh, yeah, the, the ideas and uh, the outside are just wonderful uh, places to be. So um, thank you. Um, so I will get you to stop screen share and I will share. Um, And there we go. So uh, finally, um, we have, and, and I recognize it's, it's one minute to one. Uh, I know that uh, some people will need to go. We are recording this. Um, we'll go, we'll be having a, a quick presentation uh, from Emma McDonald about uh, funding. She'll reiterate some of the funding opportunities um, that are available, as well as sharing some other solar, small solar implements that um, farmers, farmers specifically can use, but business owners could get inspired by too. Um, so I'll pass that over to her. But again, at the end, uh, we'll have questions. Um, uh, and uh, so please hold on to those and we'll just move forward fast now. So I'll pass this on to uh, Emma. Um, just as uh, just a little bit of uh, introduction to her and her um, her organization, she is the manager of innovation and stewardship at Farms at Work, um, and uh, she uh, she Farms at Work's mission uh, is to promote is to promote healthy, active farmland across East Central Ontario. Uh, Farms at Work are active in Peterborough, Halliburton, Hastings, Northumberland, Kawartha Lakes, and Durham. So please visit their website. They do have a, a newsletter. So get on their mailing list. Um, they provide lots of really interesting uh, material uh, and innovations that farmers can use. So uh, I will ask uh, Emma to tell us a little bit more about uh, our, uh, financial support. Awesome. Thanks, Jackie. Hi, folks. Um, I do have some funding opportunities to share and incentives to um, that hopefully can support businesses and farmers on their on their journey towards solar implementation. Um, this information will also be shared in PDF form in, in a little bit more depth after we wrap up today. Um, so I'll begin with opportunities for farm businesses specifically, and then move on to businesses more generally. There are so many applications for solar power on farms. Um, it can be put to use basically anywhere we use fossil fuels or rely on the electrical grid. Um, so from heating buildings, heating water, even running heavy machinery like tractors, there are solar tractors available. Um, and many success stories uh, on agrovoltaic farming, which is the sort of the marriage between uh, solar arrays, solar panels, and uh, cultivating crops in and amongst or even grazing livestock in and around uh, solar panels. So I would encourage folks to look into those. 
Two of the probably most common uh, farm solar applications would be through electric fencing for livestock and solar powered watering systems. Um, solar obviously enables us to implement those sorts of tools just about anywhere in remote and in off grid areas, which is uh, particularly um, beneficial for farms. Um, and luckily, there are some funding opportunities that support both of those applications. Um, so there's two funding programs available, one through Kawartha Conservation and one through uh, OSHA, the Ontario Soil and Crop Improvement Association, that would support the installation of exclusionary fencing for livestock to protect bodies of water on your farm. It's best practice to exclude livestock from open water to avoid contamination, of course. Um, and since you'd be eliminating their water source, these programs also fund the installation of alternative watering systems, um, including those using solar power. So the water fund from Kawartha Conservation is a grant. They provide up to $4,000 to landowners within Kawartha Lakes and Durham region. Um, and this funding can cover solar fencing um, and solar powered water pumps as well. Uh, this program is currently open. So if this sounds like sounds like you, I would encourage you to, uh, to look into it. Um, OSHA's Species at Risk Farm Incentive Program also supports the installation of fencing and water systems. The reimbursement rate um, and funding cap depends on whether your farm is known to be a home for species at risk. So projects directly benefiting species at risk, 60% um, of project costs uh, are covered up to $20,000 for projects that indirectly benefit species at risk. The funding is a little bit lower. Um, just to note, there are some additional eligibility requirements for OSHA's programs, um, including having an environmental farm plan. So if you don't have one already, I would highly encourage you to look, look into uh, attending one of their, their weekend workshops to get an EFP. Um, but I'll, I'll uh, encourage folks to check out their full program guide for all of the details there. Um, there are two um, un upcoming programs also through OSHA. Um, on the next slide, please, Jackie. Um, and these provide funding uh, for electric fencing to support rotational grazing systems. Um, so the On-Farm Climate Action Fund offers a cost share funding opportunity for rotational grazing systems and alternative water infrastructure, as I mentioned earlier. This funding can apply to both new installations of rotational setups or existing ones if you're wanting to enhance or expand um, a system that you've already implemented. There are some minimum size requirements for these, um, and the funding available depends on whether your farm is home to species at risk. Uh, there's also similar funding for cross fencing for rotational grazing. Um, this provides cost share funding for cross fencing, which is um, essentially internal fencing that divides an existing pasture. Um, and this, of course, always, uh, also applies to solar powered uh, electric fencing and watering systems. Um, and again, the size requirements for pasture uh, impacts your ability to access funding um, and whether or not there are species at risk known to be located on your farm will impact how much funding is available to you as well. Um, and both of those fund those programs are upcoming, so they're not quite open yet, but likely in spring 2024, they'll be made available. And on the next slide, um, I'll move sort of beyond the farm to incentives more generally uh, for businesses hoping and planning to install solar systems. So there's two tax credits that you should be aware of. The Clean Technology Investment Tax Credit offers businesses a refundable tax credit to help offset the cost of installing um, these power systems. Credits would range from between 20 to 30 percent of the product cost. And because this is a refundable tax credit, these amounts are subtracted from your taxes owing. So if you owe um, a small amount or none at all, it could translate to a next tax re net tax refund um, in that event. Um, the Clean Electricity Investment Tax Credit is very similar, but it's directed to non-taxable entities. So municipalities, crown corporations, likely churches, those sorts of groups. Um, and this is a 15% refundable tax credit. Um, 
And the final two, um, these I believe were, uh, JP mentioned the capital cost allowance. Um, this is a tool that allows corporations to reduce their taxes owing through higher depreciation rates. And if you're not familiar, if you're not an accountant, um, depreciation is an accounting method that's used to calculate the declining value of a physical asset over the course of its usable life. Um, and the CRA would would determine those depreciation rate, rates for different classes of capital assets. Solar energy systems um, are eligible for 43.1 and 43.2, those two classes. Um, and they have quite high depreciation rates. Um, and there's currently an incentive um, that in 2024, I believe it's 75% uh, um, uh, depreciation rate. So um, making use of that incentive can significantly reduce your, your taxable income. And I would recommend that you talk to an accountant to have a more fulsome understanding of it, because I am certainly not one. <laughs> um, the final opportunity that I'll share is the Federal Development Fund. Uh, this is a, an interest-free loan program for businesses in Southern Ontario, completing projects that align with its priority areas, one of which would be their clean economic growth priority. Um, solar power would certainly align with that one. So this funding can cover up to 50% of project costs um, and ranges between 125,000 to $10 million. So potentially quite a, quite a bit of money up for grabs. This program is quite competitive, but it's offered three times a year. Um, and it's set to open uh, to applicants in winter 2024. So um, in the next couple of months, so keep an eye out. And that's all I've got for you. Thanks so much, folks. Thank you, Emma. So uh, we are going to uh, put the, open the floor to questions and comments. I'm wondering if anyone has any questions for our speakers. And is, that's because they did such a great job, right? <laughs> Were there any uh, questions in the uh, chat, Natasha? Yes, there were. Uh, Yay, okay. I'm sorry about the squeaker, that's my puppy. Um, so there was a question that I'm gonna read just so that it's recorded. It was answered in the chat, um, but Todd Grayson asks if Norm has experienced any weather-related damages to the greenhouse roof at all, um, from hail, ice, wind damage, those kinds of things. And Norm says that they haven't had a real test um, from hail yet, but one of the reasons why they went with this product was that it had claimed to be more resilient to hail um, than say polycarbonate. Um, so the slope is significant. And that means that any snow load that accumulates slides off readily, so no issues yet. Um, there was a follow-up question um, about how does UV affect the roof? Um, any forecasted issues? It sounds like not within its 20 year lifespan. Um, right. that, did I cover that well, Norm? Yes, well done. Okay. Um, <laughs> and then there was a second question. This one um, was for Emma. She mentioned the um, solar powered tractors. Do you have any more information available on this or is there maybe somewhere you could point to for folks to learn more about solar tractors? Absolutely. Um, I, would, I would point you in the direction of a fellow named Tony Neal. Um, N-E-I-L-E. -E. He runs Wheelbarrow Farm in Uxbridge, Ontario. He is, um, he's been using a solar tractor for several years. I believe 2017 was the year that he bought it. Um, and he's sort of in the process of uh, transitioning his entire farm to solar. That's my understanding. But he is a, he loves to spread the solar gospel and share his experience. So reaching out to Tony from Wheelbarrow Farm would be, I think, um, my recommendation if you're curious about solar tractors and how, you know, the nitty gritty, how, how does it work on, on an actual farm? Great. Thank you. And I see a question from Scott. Yeah, so as I understand, the only thing for like a retail building like ours would be the uh, zero interest rate loan that opens up in May 24th. That would be the only financial uh, resources available. Is that correct? In terms of upfront funding, that's my understanding. Um, if you have that solar already implemented and you have the funds to install, um, then there are the, the tax incentives that help help cover that cost over over a period of time and recuperate. Um, but in terms of upfront funding, 
that uh, the federal development grant or, or loan program um, is, is my understanding, but perhaps our experts on the panel know a bit more about um, what your options might be. JP, did you have anything to add to that? No, the main thing would be the, the tax credit and the accelerated write down if that's uh, of value. I will say that I would love to earn enough money that uh, that writing things off faster and expensing things faster was a was a positive thing. Well, it is it is a refundable tax credit, so uh, maybe it's not right away, but you'll get it back in the end. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so I will just move along. I sorry, Jackie, yeah. just one more question. Oh, before. sorry. Thank you for catching that. Um, Go ahead. Yes, yeah, so Jamie is wondering if there is a ballpark of replacement equipment after the 25 year lifespan. I'm wondering if this is the cost for the equipment. Yeah. To whom is that directed? It isn't. Um, so if anybody has information, fantastic. No. Nope. Jamie, what are Wait. you referring to? Are you referring to uh, to uh, who, who's, whose presentation are you referring to? Well, I, I, in the context of solar, I mean, what is what is the, the ballpark replacement equipment after the 25 year lifespan? Uh, the solar panels in the case of a solar electric system, their um, performance does degrade a little bit over time, a fraction of a percent per year, but they will keep, uh, keep producing for, for decades. Uh, the inverters are the power conversion devices. Uh, they have a typical 20-year lifespan, so they will require replacement at some point, but it is typically a small fraction of the total project cost. Uh, and beyond that, we get into the weeds, and I would want to have a conversation with you offline, I think. Great. That's great. Thank you, JP. Any others? Great. Um, thank you. Uh, thank you for to our speakers. Uh, it's always a treat uh, listening to listening to and getting inspired by your experience. Um, uh, Generation Solar, Woodley Farms, Lake Edge Cottages are all very active and involved uh, community uh, citizens and businesses. And so we appreciate uh, their time very much today and putting this together for you. It's very generous of you. Um, so I am going to uh, also thank our sponsors, <laughs> our partners, which is the City of Peterborough, the County of Peterborough, and Farms at Work. Uh, and finally, just to let you know, uh, we are recruiting. We're always recruiting to Green Economy uh, Peterborough. Um, please go to our website. You can see it there, uh, greeneconomypeterborough.ca. And um, you know, you can. I, I would recommend a sign up to our newsletter. And if you're really keen on learning more, you can book me for a 15 minute chat. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I thank you for everybody for coming out. <laughs> I really appreciate uh, the high level of interest uh, in this topic today. So uh, be in touch and um, thank you. And thank you for uh, to uh, everyone who was able to stay over time here today. Thanks, enjoy your spring.